A collection of 11 classic short stories, read by Mike Bennett. These stories were originally recorded for the Mike Bennett Sometimes podcast between 2008 and 2010. The Penance by Saki Octavian Ruttel was one of those lively, cheerful individuals on whom amiability had set its unmistakable stamp, and like most of his kind, his soul's peace depended in large measure on the unstinted approval of his fellows. In hunting to death a small tabby cat, he had done a thing of which he scarcely approved himself and he was glad when the gardener had hidden the body in its hastily dug grave under a lone oak tree in the meadow, the same tree that the hunted quarry had climbed as a last effort towards safety. It had been a distasteful and seemingly ruthless deed, but circumstances had demanded the doing of it. Octavian kept chickens, At least he kept some of them. Others vanished from his keeping, leaving only a few blood-stained feathers to mark the manner of their going. The tabby cat, from the large grey house that stood with its back to the meadow, had been detected in many furtive visits to the hen-coops, and after due negotiation with those in authority at the grey house, a sentence of death had been agreed on. "'The children will mind, but uh, they need not know,' had been the last word on the matter. The children in question were a standing puzzle to Octavian. In the course of a few months he considered that he should have known their names, ages, the dates of their birthdays, and have been introduced to their favourite toys.' They remained, however, as non-committal as the long, blank wall that shut them off from the meadow, a wall over which their three heads sometimes appeared at odd moments. They had parents in India, that much Octavian had learned in the neighbourhood. The children, beyond grouping themselves garment-wise into sexes, a girl and two boys, carried their life story no further on his behoof, and now, it seemed, he was engaged in something which touched them closely, but must be hidden from their knowledge. The poor, helpless chickens had gone one by one to their doom, so it was meet that their destroyer should come to a violent end. Yet Octavian felt some qualms when his share of the violence was ended, The little cat, headed off from its wanted tracks of safety, had raced unfriended from shelter to shelter, and its end had been rather piteous. Octavian walked through the long grass of the meadow with a step less jaunty than usual, and as he passed beneath the shadow of the high blank wall, he glanced up and became aware that his hunting had had undesired witnesses. Three white-set faces were looking down at him, and if ever an artist wanted a threefold study of cold human hate, impotent yet unyielding, raging yet masked in stillness, he would have found it in the triple gaze that met Doc Davian's eye. "'I'm sorry, but it had to be done.' said Octavian, with genuine apology in his voice. Beast! The answer came from three throats with startling intensity. Octavian felt that the blank wall would not be more impervious to his explanations than the bunch of human hostility that peered over its coping. He wisely decided to withhold his peace overtures to a more hopeful occasion. Two days later, he ransacked the best sweet shop in the neighbouring market town for a box of chocolates that, by its size and contents, should fitly atone for the dismal deed done under the oak tree in the meadow. The two first specimens that were shown him he hastily rejected. One had a group of chickens pictured on its lid, 
The other bore the portrait of a tabby kitten. A third sample was more simply bedecked with a spray of painted poppies, and Octavian hailed the flowers of forgetfulness as a happy omen. He felt distinctly more at ease with his surroundings when the imposing package had been sent across to the grey house, and a message returned to say that it had been duly given to the children. The next morning he sauntered with purposeful steps past the long blank wall on his way to the chicken run and piggery that stood at the bottom of the meadow. The three children were perched at their accustomed lookout, and their range of sight did not seem to concern itself with Octavian's presence. As he became depressingly aware of the aloofness of their gaze, he also noted a strange variegation in the herbage at his feet. The greensward, for a considerable space around, was strewn and speckled with a chocolate-coloured hail, enlivened here and there with gay tinsel-like wrappings or the glistening mauve of crystallised violets. It was as though the fairy paradise of a greedy-minded child had taken shape and substance in the vegetation of the meadow. Octavian's blood-money had been flung back at him in scorn. To increase his discomfiture, the march of events tended to shift the blame of ravaged chicken coops from the supposed culprit who had already paid full forfeit. The young chicks were still carried off, and it seemed highly probable that the cat had only haunted the chicken run to prey on the rats which harboured there. Through the flowing channels of servant talk, the children learned of this belated revision of verdict, and Octavian one day picked up a sheet of copybook paper on which was painstakingly written... Beast! Rats eated your chickens! More ardently than ever did he wish for an opportunity for sloughing off the disgrace that enwrapped him and earning some happier nickname from his three unsparing judges. And one day a chance inspiration came to him. Olivia! His two-year-old daughter was accustomed to spend the hour from high noon till one o'clock with her father while the nursemaid gobbled and digested her dinner and novelette. About the same time, the blank wall was usually enlivened by the presence of its three small wardens. Octavian, with seeming carelessness of purpose, brought Olivia well within hail of the watchers, and noted with hidden delight the growing interest that dawned in that hitherto sternly hostile quarter. His little Olivia, with her sleepy, placid ways, was going to succeed where he, with his anxious, well-meant overtures, had so signally failed. He brought her a large yellow dahlia, which she grasped tightly in one hand and regarded with a stare of benevolent boredom, such as one might bestow on amateur classical dancing performed in aid of a deserving charity. Then he turned shyly to the group perched on the wall and asked with affected carelessness, "'Do you like flowers?' Three solemn nods rewarded his venture. Oh, "'Which sorts do you like best?' he asked, this time with a distinct betrayal of eagerness in his voice. "'Those with all the colours over there!' Three chubby arms pointed to a distinct tangle of sweet pea. Childlike, they had asked for what lay farthest from hand— but Octavian trotted off gleefully to obey their welcome behest. He pulled and plucked with unsparing hand, and brought every variety of tint that he could see into his bunch that was rapidly becoming a bundle. Then he turned to retrace his steps, and found the blank wall blanker and more deserted than ever, while the foreground was void of all trace of Olivia. 
Far down the meadow, three children were pushing a go-kart at the utmost speed they could muster in the direction of the piggeries. It was Olivia's go-kart, and Olivia sat in it, somewhat bumped and shaken by the pace at which she was being driven, but apparently retaining her wanted composure of mind. Octavian stared for a moment at the rapidly moving group, and then started in hot pursuit, shedding as he ran sprays of blossom from the mass of sweet bee that he still clutched in his hands. Fast as he ran, the children had reached the piggery before he could overtake them, and he arrived just in time to see Olivia wondering but unprotesting, hauled and pushed up to the roof of the nearest sty. They were old buildings, in need of some repair, and the rickety roof would certainly not have borne Octavian's weight if he had attempted to follow his daughter and her captors on their new vantage ground. "'What are you going to do with her?' he panted. There was no mistaking the grim trend of mischief in those flushed but sternly composed young faces. "'Hang her in chains over a slow fire,' said one of the boys. Evidently they had been reading English history. "'Throw her down, and the pigs will devour her, every bit except the palms of her hands,' said the other boy. It was also evident that they had studied biblical history. The last proposal was the one which most alarmed Octavian, since it might be carried into effect at a moment's notice. There had been cases, he remembered, of pigs eating babies. "'You surely wouldn't treat my poor little Olivia in that way,' he pleaded. "'You killed our little cat,' came in stern reminder from three throats. "'I'm very sorry I did,' said Octavian, and if there is a standard of measurement in truths, Octavian's statement was assuredly a large nine. "'We should be very sorry when we've killed Olivia,' said the girl, "'but we can't be sorry till we've done it.' The inexorable child logic rose like an unyielding rampart before Octavian's scared pleadings. Before he could think of any fresh line of appeal, his energies were called out in another direction. Olivia had slid off the roof and fallen with a soft, unctuous splash into a morass of muck and decaying straw. Octavian scrambled hastily over the pigsty wall to her rescue, and at once found himself in a quagmire that engulfed his feet. Olivia, after the first shock of surprise at her sudden drop through the air, had been mildly pleased at finding herself in close and unstinted contact with the sticky element that oozed around her, but as she began to sink gently into the bed of slime, a feeling dawned on her that she was not, after all, very happy, and she began to cry in the tentative fashion of the normally good child. Octavian, battling with the quagmire, which seemed to have learned the rare art of giving way at all points without yielding an inch, saw his daughter slowly disappearing in the engulfing slush, her smeared face further distorted with the contortions of whimpering wonder, while from their perch on the pigsty roof the three children looked down with the cold, unpitying detachment of the Parquet sisters. "'I can't reach her in time,' gasped Octavian. "'She'll be choked in the muck. Oh, won't you help her?' "'No one helped our cat,' came the inevitable reminder. Oh, "'I'll do anything to show you how sorry I am about that,' cried Octavian, with a further desperate flounder which carried him scarcely two inches forward. "'Will you stand under a white sheet by the grave?' "'Yes!' screamed Octavian, "'holding a candle and saying, "'I'm a miserable beast!' "'Octavian agreed to both suggestions. "'For a long, long time?' "'For half an hour,' said Octavian. "'There was an anxious ring in his voice "'as he named the time limit. "'Was there not the president of a German king "'who did open-air penance for several days and nights "'at Christmas time, clad only in his shirt?' 
Fortunately, the children did not appear to have read German history, and half an hour seemed long and goodly in their eyes. All right, came with threefold solemnity from the roof, and a moment later a short ladder had been laboriously pushed across to Octavian, who lost no time in propping it against the low pigsty wall. Scrambling gingerly along its rungs, he was able to lean across the morass that separated him from his slowly foundering offspring and extract her like an unwilling cork from its slushy embrace. A few minutes later, he was listening to the shrill and repeated assurances of the nursemaid that her previous experience of filthy spectacles had been on a notably smaller scale. That same evening, when twilight was deepening into darkness, Octavian took up his position as penitent under the lone oak tree, having first carefully undressed the part. Clad in a zephyr shirt, which on this occasion thoroughly merited its name, he held in one hand a lighted candle, and in the other a watch, into which the soul of a dead plumber seemed to have passed, a box of matches lay at his feet, and was resorted to on the fairly frequent occasions when the candle succumbed to the night breezes. The house loomed inscrutable in the middle distance, but as Octavian conscientiously repeated the formula of his penance, he felt certain that three pairs of solemn eyes were watching his moth-shared vigil. And the next morning... His eyes were gladdened by a sheet of copybook paper lying beside the blank wall, on which was written the message, Unbeast. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts from me, either here at podiobooks.com or at www.mikebennettpodcast.com. Music on the podcast, Chopin is Dead, by Adhesion. More details at www.evilresidence.com.